In the first part of this video, I introduced you to what a field effect transistor is and how it works, and I tried to compare it with its cousin, the bipolar junction transistor. Now I'd like to show you some simple circuits that use each of these transistors in various ways to amplify and process signals. Now let's see the schematic symbols for our transistors. For bipolar junction transistors, these are the schematic symbols for the two types of transistor. PNP is on top, NPN is on the bottom. For each symbol, the collector is at the top, base is in the center, and the emitter is on the bottom. The arrow in each schematic symbol refers to the polarity of the junction between the base and the emitter. Forward biasing, or turning on a PNP transistor, requires that the base emitter voltage is negative. To forward bias an NPN transistor, the base emitter voltage must be positive. One way to remember how the schematic symbol of the transistor goes, just remember, the arrow of the NPN transistor is not pointing in NPN. The PNP's arrow is pointing in PNP. For field effect transistors, the schematic symbols are these. The N channel JFET symbol is on the top and the P channel JFET is on the bottom. For each symbol, the drain is above the source and the arrow in the gate refers to the gate to channel polarity. The JFET is operated by reverse biasing the gate with respect to the channel terminals, and to reverse bias the end channel JFET, the gate voltage must be negative with respect to the source and drain. To reverse bias the P channel JFET, the gate voltage must be positive compared to the channel. Now let's see some circuit examples for these devices. This circuit is a common emitter class A amplifier with an NPN transistor. I explained its workings in part two of my What is a Transistor video, but I'll recap it quickly for now. The heart of this circuit is the resistor R1 and the transistor T1. They are arranged in series as a voltage divider, and the output voltage at the collector is proportional to the resistance across the transistor versus the resistance of R1. As the signal at the transistor's base changes, the resistance between the collector and the emitter of the transistor changes, and the output voltage changes along with it. A tiny change in input signal causes a large change in the transistor's resistance, so this is how the amplification happens. In order to properly bias the base emitter junction, there is a second voltage divider present, created by R2 and R3 on the left. This adds a small amount of DC voltage to the base, ensuring that the base voltage is high enough to get the transistor out of cutoff, but still low enough that the transistor isn't in saturation. The P-channel JFET is a functional equivalent to the NPN transistor in that it's a resistor whose value changes based on input signal, and the gate has to have a positive input voltage to function. The main difference here is that as the gate voltage rises, the resistance across the channel rises, whereas with a bipolar junction transistor, as base voltage rises, the resistance across the collector and emitter falls. This means that the output phase will be different for the two devices, but your ears will never know the difference, so it's not really a problem. One more note about the JFET. Its channel resistance is voltage controlled, and currents going through the gate, if any, will be tiny. Remember, it's a reverse bias diode. So the input biasing resistors, R2 and R3, are usually very large. At least several hundred kilo ohms each, usually mega ohms are used, so biasing current is kept small. Now biasing a PNP bipolar junction transistor is a bit trickier. If we wanted to keep it simple, all we need to do is use a negative power supply. This way all the polarities in the circuit are reversed, and even if the input voltage is positive, the biasing resistors, R2 and R3, can add enough negative voltage to it so that the overall signal at the base is negative. However, if we want to use a positive voltage power supply, it's certainly possible to do so. First, in order to get the polarity of the emitter base junction sorted out, we flip the transistor upside down so that the emitter is more positive than the collector. Now we have to ensure that there is a negative input voltage at the base. However, when I say that the base voltage has to be negative, I don't mean it has to be less than zero. It only has to be more negative than the emitter of the transistor, so that the base is forward biased. One way to make sure of this is to set up our circuit so that the voltage divider is like this. Now the transistor is the top resistor in its voltage divider, so there will be a voltage on the resistor R1 below it. We calculate the resistances of R2 and R3 so that the voltage at R3 is low enough to make the transistor go active. This also means that the output voltage of the circuit will be measured across the resistor R1 instead of across the transistor. 
With this circuit, as the voltage at the base rises, the emitter base junction will be more weakly biased, and the resistance across the transistor will increase. As it does, the voltage across the transistor will increase, and output voltage at R1 will decrease. Lowering base input voltage will cause the base and emitter to be more strongly biased. The emitter collector resistance drops, and the transistor's voltage will decrease. This causes the voltage dropped across R1 to proportionally increase. So, the circuit's output voltage will decrease as base voltage increases, and the output voltage will increase as long as the base voltage decreases. Once again, with the bipolar junction transistor, the output will be out of phase with the input. One thing to watch out for in this circuit. The transistor is connected directly to the power supply's voltage supply terminal, so that its output current can be very high. This circuit is therefore more of a current amplifier than a voltage amplifier, but it will amplify voltage too. The thing is, now you have to be careful of what the circuit's output voltage will be connected to. Let's say you have it hooked up to an LED. When the base voltage goes very low, the transistor will be saturated, and the transistor's resistance will be very low. This allows a lot of current to flow through it. The thing is, when the LED is forward biased and illuminated, its resistance is low too. So in this case, when the base voltage goes low, you will have two very small resistances between the power supply's power and common terminals. The scientific term for this condition is a short circuit. The transistor and the LED will blow, the magic smoke will be released, and that will be the end of the project. So just be careful, okay? The N-channel JFET is a functional equivalent to the PNP bipolar junction transistor, in that it requires a negative voltage at the gate to control the resistance from source to drain. Once again, one answer is to make it the top component in the voltage divider, and set up our bias resistors R2 and R3 so that the voltage across R3 is less than R1, making the gate voltage negative with respect to the channel, reverse biasing the gate. You don't need to flip the JFET over and make the source more positive than the drain in this case. Okay, let's go over what we know about bipolar junction transistors and compare them to field effect transistors. With bipolar junction transistors, when there is no base input, the resistance between the collector and emitter is very high. Cutoff. Adding input signal at the base causes the collector-emitter resistance to decrease. There is no easy mathematical formula where we can input our base voltage and get collector resistance, so we'll use the old standby current equation, collector-emitter current equals HFE, or beta, times the base emitter current. When the base input is very large, the resistance between the collector and the emitter is zero. It's saturated. With field effect transistors, when there is no signal at the gate, the source drain resistance is zero. It's saturated. When the gate voltage rises, the resistance between the source and drain begins to increase. When the gate voltage is high enough, the resistance between source and drain is infinite and no current flows between source and drain. The transistor is cut off, pinched off. When the field effect transistor's gate voltage is between saturation and pinch off, the equation for calculating source drain current is this simple thing here. Huh? Okay, there are two things you need to know about this equation. First, it doesn't mean much, since variations in manufacturing mean that each device is going to react a bit differently, so this equation isn't actually much good at calculating current going through the channel. Second, take a look at that last term on the right. You see that it's squared. It has an exponent of 2. This means that, between saturation and cutoff, the output of this device is not linear. Let me show you graphically what I mean. This will be a graph of collector current versus base current, with base current on the x-axis and collector current on the y-axis. For a bipolar junction transistor with an HFE of, say, 100, this is what the transistor's performance will look like. The bipolar junction's output formula, IC equals HFE times IB, will look like this one on the graph. Resistance on the bipolar junction transistor starts out very large, with little current flow, and as greater input current is applied, the resistance drops and the current rises. This is why we say the bipolar junction transistor is a linear device. However, the output graph of a field effect transistor looks like this. The field effect transistor's resistance starts out low, with a large amount of current flowing, and as gate voltage rises and the channel is pinched off, the current decreases. 
the performance of the FET isn't linear, as you can see. The drain current formula has a squared term in it, which means there's a quadratic equation with a parabolic curve as an output graph. And this is what happens when you have a parabolic output. Let's say you have a sine wave input to your amplifier like this. The output of a bipolar junction transistor would look like this. The input and output shapes match, no distortion. However, inputting a similar sine wave into a field effect transistor would produce an output like this. Part of the input sine wave will be amplified more and part of the sine wave will be amplified less. In the end, you end up with this odd distortion. I don't know what you'd call this, but for now I will just say that it's parabolic distortion. This is why you don't usually see field effect transistors used in audio amps. However, you have to remember that at the heart of a JFET is a reverse biased diode. A bipolar junction transistor has a base emitter resistance of its own, which varies linearly also, but it's a lot lower than the gate source resistance of a FET. If you have an input signal that's a few microvolts and a few microamps in strength, feeding that signal into a transistor will be like shorting out that input signal and it'll just be obliterated. However, a field effect transistor is ideal for a tiny signal like that, since the input resistance through the gate to the drain is near infinite. Look at our graph again. Now, for several millivolts of gate voltage, our output graph looks like this. However, if our signal is a fraction of a millivolt, then we can zoom in on our graph. Now, at the microvolt range, this graph looks a lot better. If we zoom out again, we will see the curvature of the graph, and mathematically, at this zoom level, it's still a nonlinear parabola shape, but at this scale, it's practically linear, which is good enough for most people. This means that for very small input voltages, like from a studio mic or an electric guitar or a phonograph needle, a FET would be a viable choice. As you can see from our graph, the output current of the FET amp would still be in the milliamp range, but that's big enough to feed into our bipolar junction transistor audio amp for further amplification. This is why you will see FETs used in preamps or in the first stage of a studio amp. Also, there are op amps that use them as first stage, too. All right, it's time to wrap this up. I'm not going to go through a lot of mathematical examples of how to set up a particular circuit, because there are a lot of other examples of that out here in YouTube. Uh, here's a couple of links to check out if you want to. And uh, I really just wanted to leave you with the fact that a transistor is pretty much a simple device once you get past all the math and everything. And now that you know basically how it works, you'll be able to watch these other people's videos and it'll make a lot more sense for you. And that was my main purpose here. Thanks for watching.